I notice you didn't say that I look far too young to have done everything I've done in my life. <laughs> I also have to say that Stoke Pride is certainly an education every time I go to it. Um, somebody took a selfie with me, a young man who was also wearing a dog collar, but very different from the dog collar I was wearing. <laughs> Oh, it's a fun life. Right. <laughs> I, I really did enjoy um, that talk, Gareth. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm only sorry I can't actually be... Where has he gone? He's down there. Can't be in your group. But I, I would value a chance to chat with you because I think particularly the mental health issues amongst young people is something that I'm very concerned about. And uh, I think, yeah. And uh, interestingly, I discovered only this week the, the correlation between... Um, mental health, I health issues, young people who are sleeping on the streets of our cities in increasing numbers, and the LGBT plus community, um, those relationships are actually quite frightening. The, the high percentage of young people who are sleeping on our streets who have been thrown out of their accommodation by families or whatever um, because of their sexual orientation and identity. Um, it's a hidden factor. Um, but it's something that I think that we need to take very seriously. So I, I will value a chat with that perhaps over lunch if, you don't, if I don't give you indigestion. Um, <clears throat> later next month, members of the royal family uh, will attend a royal variety show held in their honour. Poor Prince Charles, I'm sure it will be the best 70th birthday present he could have imagined. <laughs> um, the serious side of that is that it will raise money for the Artists' Benevolent Fund as well as showcasing some amazing performances. Among those who will be appearing is a chap called Lee Ridley, the self-styled lost voice guy, who was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at the age of six months and who has not been able to speak for over 30 years. He pre-programs his comedy routines into a voice synthesizer, the sort of thing that, um, uh, I've forgotten his name, the famous um, Stephen, Stephen Hawking. Hawking, thank you. Thank you for that prompting, off, off stage there. Stephen Hawking used. And because both his content and his timing are absolutely incredible, he was the winner of this year's national television programme, Britain's Got Talent. Some of you who have need to get a life may have sat and watched it every <laughs> Saturday night. The runner-up on that programme was Robert White, who describes himself as the only gay aspergic quarter Welsh comic on the British comedy circuit. He also won people's votes with his chaotic comedy style and his improvised music skills. Now, I would suggest that until relatively recently, these two men would not have been allowed to appear on mainstream Saturday evening television, let alone win the two top places in such a prestigious competition by receiving millions of votes from the general public. Put within a wider context of a theatrical movement that is urging directors to cast more women over the age of 35, BAME actors, those from the LGBT plus community and those living with physical and mental challenges into leading roles, both in theatre and on television. And we could justifiably say that there's a genuine sense of culture change evolving in our entertainment industry in this country and that that reflects the changes within our wider society. Some might speculate that it's the other way around and that it is the changes in culture which are stimulating the changes in our society. My guess is that rather than a chicken and egg argument, culture and society actually move alongside each other as they influence and reflect attitudes and encourage new ways of thinking and being. There have been times when the Christian church in this country led society and influenced ways of attitude, thinking and being. Perhaps now we have to have the humility to accept 
that possibly at the moment God is working through society and culture in order to bring about more mutual respect of difference and a greater sense of rejoicing at the diversity of God's creation, promoting greater justice and equality for all people, and that the church needs to learn from that. Certainly, our culture and our society were very different in December 1991, when the House of Bishops of the Church of England issued a statement to the General Synod about issues in human sexuality. This statement, issued in 1991, remains the key teaching of the House of Bishops on the pastoral outworking of the Church's views on human sexuality. And today, those considering training for ordination as deacons and priests within the Church of England are required to read it and to assent to living within its guidelines. Society and culture was also very different in 1998 when the Lambeth Conference passed Resolution 110, which states, and I don't apologise for reading it all because I think it's important that you hear it, we believe that this vision of sexual intercourse as an act of total commitment belongs properly within permanent married relationships. We believe that marriage as a union of a man and a woman in a covenant of love marked by exclusivity and lifelong commitment, and thirdly, faithful, sexually abstinent love in singleness and non-marital friendships is the teaching of Scripture. It therefore expresses the character and will of God. Now, although this resolution does not have any direct legal status or it's not a regulation in the Church of England, unlike that House of Bishops statement, it does have a considerable moral force as a resolution of Anglican bishops from around the world, and thus remains the teaching of the Church of England, however much culture, society, and indeed the thinking of many Christians has changed over the past 20 years. And as a bishop... It remains the status quo which I am required to see is upheld. It's also important to quote some other words from that resolution. We commit ourselves to listen to the experience of homosexual persons and we wish to assure them that they are loved by God and that all baptised, believing and faithful persons, regardless of sexual orientation, are four members of the body of Christ. While rejecting homosexual practice as incompatible with Scripture, calls on all our people to minister pastorally and sensitively to all, irrespective of sexual orientation, and to condemn irrational fear of homosexuals, violence within marriage, and any trivialization and commercialization of sex. Again, I think it's really important that everybody hears this because everybody needs to understand the point in which we're starting. And it gives a bit more context to some of the issues that certainly within the Church of England we are currently grappling with. For those who, like me, find the bureaucratic organisation of the Anglican Church a little bit baffling, uh, let me just explain the Lambeth Conference, which passed this resolution that I've just read to you, part of which I've read to you, is a periodic meeting that brings together all the bishops of the Anglican Communion from across the world. Of course, including countries where same-sex relationships are illegal. The next conference will take place in 2020, and it's possible that some bishops will not attend specifically because of what they regard as the liberalisation of the Church of England and other national Anglican churches, particularly those in America. 
irrespective of their understanding of biblical teaching, any changes in the status quo would put them in a place of conflict with their national governments. And Christians, already the most persecuted of the world's faith, would be at risk as a result. The House of Bishops comprises of the two archbishops of Canterbury and York and the diocesan bishops. We are in the Diocese of Lichfield here, so our boss, in a sense, is the Bishop of Lichfield, and he represents uh, this area at a national level. The rest of us lesser bishops uh, are invited to join them in what is called the College of Bishops, which meets in conference just once a year. The House of Bishops, the diocesans, consults the college over many issues. It is debatable how much notice is taken of the view of the whole college, but at least, in theory, our opinions are valued. The General Synod is the decision-taking and rule-making legislature of the Church of England. As well as the House of Bishops, plus a couple of representatives from the college, it comprises of two other houses, that of the clergy and one of non-ordained people called the House of Laity. For motions put to the General Synod of the Church of England to be passed, there is usually a requirement that at least two-thirds of the members of each of the three houses have to agree. This means that some issues can take a very long time before they are resolved, and the recent legislation allowing women priests to become bishops is a very good example of that. Obviously, this can cause a lot of unhappiness and a lot of frustration within the wider church. In addition, members of the House of Clergy and members of the House of Laity are elected for a three-year period. And although elected from their diocese, they are under no obligation to vote as the majority in that diocese might wish them to. They are independent in their voting. So this brings in a real political element of Conservatives v Liberals, which, quite frankly, many feel is out of place in the Christian church. But as politics is about people, and the church is also about people, this is a reality with which we have to live. It is in part because of these complexities, but also because we were hearing of uncertainties and ambiguities about the Church of England's position on same-sex relationships and how pastorally these were causing problems in the parishes and chaplaincies that we serve that in this diocese, the bishops wanted to issue a letter to the clergy trying simply to make clear the existing situation in the Church of England. This would, of course, be an open letter, and before being issued, was seen and approved by a group involved at a national level in the production of a teaching document on various aspects of human sexuality. And this group particularly is first focusing on the pastoral implications of this teaching document. The resulting ad clerum, which the educated amongst you, you'll know means to the clergy, but actually it was to all licensed ministers in the diocese, actually says nothing new, but simply states the present situation. Entitled Welcoming and Honouring LGBT Plus People in the Diocese of Lichfield, it sets out some pastoral guidelines for the inclusion of all people in our churches in this diocese, wanting to emphasise that in keeping with the teaching of the church, everyone has a place at the table. It reflects our commitment, as the bishops of this diocese, to encouraging people of different views to meet, pray, and talk together. It affirms the importance of access for all to baptism, confirmation, and communion, the sacraments of the church, 
and also that LGBT plus people should be in roles of leadership within our churches and the importance of mission to and alongside LGBT plus people. It says what it says and very specifically does not address the blessing of same-sex relationships or the issue of same-sex marriage because very clearly these are not at present allowed by the canons or laws of the Church of England. With almost 600 parishes and serving an area of over 2 million people, it was inevitable that the Ad Clarum letter would be given wide coverage. And as we expected, the responses have been varied. But thankfully, very few were actually unpleasant and unsigned. They went straight in the bin. <laughs> Supportive responses tended to be shorter but very positive. Those critical of what we were saying tended to be longer but well thought through, highlighting issues that will hopefully be addressed when this teaching document is finally produced. Uh, I think the time scale is that it will be ready by about 2020. The main area of concern highlighted in the letters I received focused on whether in order to be fully included we should also be stressing the need for repentance for all people, not just LGBT+, who have failed to keep the rules as outlined in that 1991 statement and affirmed in the vision of the 1998 Lambeth Conference. Clearly, as human beings, we do all fall short of what God requires, and repentance should be a constant call for all of us in our Christian lives. God is far more ready to forgive than we are ever seeking that forgiveness. However, in this, the LGBT plus community are no better or no worse than any other Christians, and we felt it would have been wrong to imply otherwise in the ad clarum. Why it is such an issue for some is because the present teaching of the church clearly states that the physical expression of sexual intimacy can only be within the context of marriage, and marriage can only be within the context of a relationship between a man and a woman. Whatever your personal view on this understanding, and however different it may be from the understanding of our culture and society as a whole, it is important to acknowledge that the pain of those who long for change and want to see their own loving relationships openly acknowledged and welcomed by a totally inclusive church is as great as the pain of those who wish to conserve the traditional teaching and be true to biblical understanding as they believe we have received it. After over 35 years ministry as a priest, it's not surprising that I have been recipient of that pain from both viewpoints and felt equally inadequate to being able to do anything but listen. I think the deepest pain comes from those who have been faithful to the teaching of the church and maintained the status quo. I think of some same-sex clergy couples who have maintained loving and faithful relationships over many years. Not in secret, their congregations invariably know and have no issues with it. And yet they have told me that they have abstained from any physical intimacy because of the teachings of the church. Thus they have been deprived from making that total commitment of love for one another that they would wish to have given. But then I also think of a person I met recently who I'm not seeing for some 40 years. <clears throat> Believe me, it's never a good idea to go back in time. The conversation was ridiculous and that I could not remember the people and incidents of whom he spoke and he certainly did not remember of any of the things or the people that I remembered. There was also a very uncomfortable atmosphere throughout our time together and this was explained when, towards the end of the lunch, I finally asked 
the inevitable question if he had ever married and been blessed with children. He told me that he was same-sex attracted, and then with a vehemence that was actually quite frightening. He said that if he had managed to embrace chastity for nearly 70 years and be true to biblical teaching, why couldn't others? And why wasn't I, as a bishop, making that clear? We are at a very difficult point of decision within the Church of England. The Ad Clarem letter is an accurate statement of how we can honour the LGBT plus community pastorally in our churches today, and even those most critical of it have graciously acknowledged that although they would wish to see more reference to repentance, it is basically true to the present <laughs> status quo. It is what the letter does not say that is their concern. Despite all the conversations that have taken place both officially and informally, opinions about that physical expression of human sexuality remain divided. And realistically, it seems unlikely that any changes in guidance about human sexuality that may or may not emerge from the teaching document will be embraced by the whole Church of England, irrespective of any decisions made by the General Synod. And certainly they will not be embraced by the whole wider Anglican Communion. So we are left with this question within the Church of England. Will we, as Christians, be able to model how to live with both integrity and with difference? And if changes were to occur that place us more in tune with the culture and society of our time, where will that leave those who have already sacrificed, and I use that word very deliberately, so much in their belief that this is what is demanded of them for the sake of the church and of the gospel? They risk my case. I hope very much that um, I shall learn a lot in our breakout group. Um, I hope if you're going to come to that breakout group, you at least have the opportunity to read the letter before you arrive. Uh, and I'm envisaging that in that group, we will be uh, just discussing things. Um, there are more pearls of wisdom to come from me. I want to hear from you. Thank you.